why we are doing them just to get that final result. So I'm just gonna open up a new, I have a notebook already open up, opened up, but what you can do if you haven't already opened up one is do new notebook and then run that if you haven't already, or if you're using the same notebook from yesterday, that's fine as well. So because I'm just starting a new one, I'm gonna import pandas as PV. So this imports the pandas package, which we've talked about yesterday. I'm setting it as a, a nickname called PD so that I don't have to type out pandas every time. So I'm gonna run that. I just have the survey link just to get the data because I don't have it on my computer. And I'm gonna get surveys um, equals pd.read CSV. And instead of um, writing the path to um, where it is in my folder, I'm just gonna put survey link. So it actually works this way too. Um, so I'm gonna load up that data and I'm gonna show you how we can solve this, um, how, why these uh, commands work. So basically the first thing we want, um, I'm gonna copy and paste the questions just so we can see it here. That. Um, So the first thing we want is we have the surveys data. We just want the species ID and the hind foot lengths, right? So how do we subset data again? We can get that um, by basically subsetting just for the values that um, for the columns that we want. and remove these. And when this gets, sorry, let's make sure. Let me just take a look for a second. Okay. So the first thing, um, you can do the drop in A at any point, um, basically, but we'll do it first just to make sure that none of the values uh, are NAs. So that surveys, we're adding the method drop NA, and we can do it like that. And then just from that, we can actually subset. And by using the two brackets, that'll get to the column names. So we want the hind species ID, like that. And then we can put a comma for hind foot length. All right, so I showed, um, loc is when you have um, columns and rows. Um, so you can use that to subset both. But um, if you just want just columns, then you can do double brackets. And if you just want rows, and you can you can do, or you just want um, uh, rows, then you do iloc or loc. But if you want both, then you would have you would always have to use loc. Uh, and if you just want rows, you would also need to do iloc or loc. But um, we can talk about that a bit um, as we're doing some of these things. So let's see what this gives us. I'm going to do the head of this first, just so you can see what it looks like. So you can see that I have the species ID and the hind foot lengths, right? These are the two columns we have, yeah. I was just curious, like, why can't we have the double square brackets? Right, so the first, one of the square brackets tells you you're going to start subsetting. The okay. second square brackets tells you it's going to be a list of columns. Okay. So that's why you have these two brackets. Um, but you can think of it as just reminder to always use the double brackets when you're doing columns. But if you think of it uh, logically, then it becomes the, the subsetting and then the, the list. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's what it looks like. I'm gonna actually save this to another variable, uh, intermediate variable, right? Um, surveys, let's just call it hind foot and species, just for the purposes of this. Um, so that will actually set it to a variable and we already know what it looks like, but what do we want is actually to get half, to set a new, um, a, new bra a new column called half hind, hind foot half, Right, so this is how we set a new column. You just actually use the same data frame name and you set the name of the column in brackets, in square brackets. And then you could set it to what? Surveys, sorry, surveys underscore HH, um, where the hind foot length divided by two. Now we can take a look at what our surveys looks like. Our surveys, our new one anyways. Now you can see, if you look at, you just like do mental math, you can see that it worked pretty well. 32 divided by two is 16. You can look just to, you know, do a sanity check to see if your code is working. And it made this new column that um, we didn't have before. 
And now to make sure, what was the last part of the question? It said that there are no NAs. We took care of that already at the beginning. And then all values are less than 30. So how do we do that is actually, again, we're going to take surveys of each H. Um, and we're going to subset, sorry, we're going to say surveys H H where surveys H H of the hind foot half is less than 30. So what's happening here is this portion will actually create, if I will show you what it looks like in a second, um, but it's actually going to create a list of, yeah, of true, false, true, false, whether or not that row meets that criteria. And then it will only subset that data frame where, those, where that criteria is met. So we're going to set that. All right, let's take a look again at surveys HH. And now you'll see, well, it's hard to see here, but they're all going to be lower than 30. But uh, yeah, just looking through, they're mostly going to be less than 30. They don't see anything greater than 30. But let's take a look at what happens when I'm actually running this portion of the code right here, just so you guys can get a sense of what that subsetting does. So you can see that for that row, it'll, for every single row in that column, it'll say true or false. It's already going to be true now because we've already set it to be that way. But um, if we had done it before, then it would uh, tell you true. Some of the rows are going to be greater than 30, so it would say false. And then when I subset in this portion, when I'm saying surveys bracket of that, it'll only take those rows where it's true. So all the falses will be removed. So then you're left with the data where hind foot half is 30, is less than 30, sorry. Um, everybody's good with uh, that from yesterday? OK. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, for sure. Is that good now? Okay. Um, so we're going to start. So today we're going to learn. Um, we're going to build on what we learned yesterday. We're going to use a, um, a kind of a process called split, apply, combine, which is commonly what is used in data science for splitting your data into groups, meaningful groups, depending on what the data is, applying some sort of common function across these groups, groupings, and then using that to combine it into a new data structure. And then uh, we're going to actually use that to then do some plotting. And then finally, at the end, we're going to combine the steps to split, apply, apply, combine to plot. Um, so this is kind of like an overview of what we'll learn today. Um, so the very first thing we're going to do is just uh, using, showing you how to use um, the, the split function to apply a common function to it. Uh, well, the split idea to apply a common function to the split data. So how we actually split um, our data is by using something called group by. The surveys.groupby, this function will group our data by the variable in which we, uh, we want to set it on. So first, I'm going to take a look at this so you guys can remember what uh, surveys looks like. It has all these um, column names, and each, each row is a sample, right? A sa um, an animal that was caught and, and surveyed. So what we're going to do is we're going to group by the genus. So that means it's going to take all the common items that belong to the same genus and group them together. We'll see what that looks like in a second. And let's take the common, um, let's take the average weight of all of these. So I'm going to, so what you do, the kind of like structure of the group by is you have group by and then you put inside what you want to group, group by. And then on the outside of those brackets use, um, of the parentheses, you use uh, what you want to actually figure out about that group. So we want to see for each genus, what is the average weight? And we can do that using the mean function like that. Okay. So just to remind you guys, there's this kind of the common structure. You'll have the data frame. You'll have the group by after that. Um, then what you're going to group by and then the item that you're going to determine some sort of uh, common, uh, some sort of uh, um, aggregated data about. And we're going to use the mean function. So let's see what that looks like. So a lot of them are NAs. That's fine, because maybe they weren't able to get that data to the, um, for each of the genuses. But then it lists all the genuses, and the, or geni, no, genuses, and then uh, tells you the average weight on the right. Um, so if so, for I think typically they'll always include the the NA data, but you can actually set um, in group by to drop NA, or you can do drop NA just as we have before. Um, maybe before we do.
and it'll only show you the ones where there are all the values there, or at least some values there to, to figure out um, a mean. Um, okay, so that was using one group by, so we, we grouped by the genus. But now what if we wanted to do group by the genus and then subset again by the sex? So then for each genus, there'd be, two, there'd be male and female, and then what is the average weight for that? So using the same kind of formatting, we're gonna do surveys dot group by, and instead we're gonna use that list, the parentheses, uh, the brackets again, um, to make a list of things that we wanna group by, the genus and the sex. And then outside of that, we're gonna do again the weight, and again, take the mean. What do we see here? We see that now it's set, subset again by the genus. It's going to appear first because that's what we listed first. And then for each of these, the male and the females um, sets, and then the average weight for that. You can again do the drop in A for now. I'm just going to ignore that. Um, so we can actually, if we wanted to like use this data again, we can actually use the subset of data by applying it to a variable, just as we have before. So I'm just going to move down. Pretty okay. So I'm going to actually copy this and then set it to a variable. I'm going to call it sur group surveys. Now it's set to a variable. Okay. I'm going to move this up a bit. Um, and then if I wanted to actually do grouped, actually, I'm going to take out the weight. So sorry, just do the portion that is the group by. So surveys are group by genus and sex. Set, run that. And now if I wanted to look at any variable um, and take the mean of that, not just the weight, uh, I could do that using the variable name grouped surveys. So for example, weight dot mean. And it'll give us the same result as we saw before. Okay. So if I didn't want the weight, I wanted the average hind foot length or something like that. We can also do that. And I'll have that as well. So you can actually use that group data and then do whatever you want to that variable that's already been pre-grouped for you because you did it in the variable. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? So here we've been using this dot mean function um, so pandas already has a lot of built-in functions for you, like the common ones like mean, max, min. Um, it probably has standard deviation, uh, variance, things like that. Um, but uh, more commonly, you can use the aggregate method. So I'm going to show you that just down here so that you can more commonly use that. I'm just going to set these. Um, so you can use any sort of function you want to apply over each of the groups. Because that's what it's been doing, is that for each of these groups, it would take all those rows that has this genus, this um, sex, and then apply the mean to those groups. But it's not always, you're not always gonna want to just do mean, max, min, these, these kind of more simple functions. You might have your own um, function that you'd wanna apply. Um, but let's just look at an example of how you would um, do that using a custom function that's not um, already used in pandas. Um, not a custom function, but a function that you have somewhere else. So first we're gonna do is import from the NumPy package as numpy, so can you run that? And then just underneath, we're gonna do grouped surveys. So numpy, I think if you saw yesterday, is a numerical Python package, which has a lot of um, different numerical uh, methods that you would need, like mean, max, and other really complex um, mathy things, I guess. Um, so we're gonna use this ag AGG, short for aggregate, and, oh, I forgot to remind you guys, um, if you haven't already, you can set your inspector mode on the side so that you can see, as we're typing up these new functions, you'll see what they do. So you can do control I if you're using JupyterLab. Um, if you're using Jupyter Notebook, it's not a, a function readily available, but um, you can do control I and then just pull it, the pane over to the side so it's nice and helpful. So I'll show you quickly what that looks like. It's the inspector, pull it over to the side. Just because of the space limitations, I'm not gonna have it open, but you guys can have that. So we're going to do group surveys of the weight. And we're going to, instead of dot mean, as we had been doing before, we're going to do this dot AGG. And NumPy has a mean function. So we're just going to show you that you know, it should give, should give the same results. 
And so I'm going to run that. And I'm going to reset index just to turn it again back into a data frame. Or to bring, yeah, I'll see what that looks like. Um, sorry. Ready to go. Oh, here. So the dot reset index will bring it, bring all these into um, columns as columns and then make it our data frame again. So we can see that it's basically um, giving us the same results as we did when we were using the dot mean function. But now imagine that you can replace how powerful it is that you can replace um, the mean function with any sort of function you want. You might want to um, change all the values to be 10 times the square the square root of the value or something like that, or square root times two plus three, depending on what whatever you need. Um, you can make your own function and then define your own function and put it in here and it'll apply it to every group that you want, right? Um, so, and, yeah. Yeah, it should be should be the same as before. Maybe it might be in different orders because you reset the index. So yeah, so it's 9.162 and then 9.1. It should be the same. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any slight differences, but yeah. Okay, so that was applying um, one function. So of course, what we've been doing is doing one thing and seeing if we can do more than one thing to it. Um, so what if we wanted to find not only the mean, but the standard deviation? So we can do that very easily using the same formatting, group surveys. So this is the group data. And we're, again, we're going to work on the weight um, variable. And we're going to aggregate, again, using the list brackets, you know, those brackets that let you know that it's a list. We're going to do numpy mean and numpy dot standard deviation. So let's see. So let's see what that gives us. So it gives us a column for the mean and a column for the standard deviation. So it's going to do that for every single one of the groups too. And you can imagine chaining together a couple of these, um, not chaining together, but putting together as many different um, uh, aggregate functions as you like um, on the same groups that you've already defined. And you don't need to run it two times. You can do it all within one call. So, um, yeah. So after aggregate, you put like a parenthesis because it's a function. Yeah, exactly. And then Square bracket, bracket, square bracket because it's a list of functions. So it's, uh, yeah, exactly. So commonly what happens is if you have more than one thing applied to the same uh, role, it's like, in this case, you want to apply these common things to the aggregate function. Okay. So it needs to be in a list because they're um, they're belonging to the same role as so the square brackets. Brackets. Yeah, the square brackets mean it's a list, yeah. So you're listing which ones you want to run on, the, on these. So it's not only like applying to columns or to, but also to functions or the things you have. You can yeah, exactly. You can put anything in a list, really. Um, yeah, lists are in Python can take anything you want. It can be a list of lists. It can be a list of dictionaries. It can be a list of anything you want. Exactly. Um, good question. So, um, so the, with common, uh, function names, you can actually pass them to pandas as just um, a, a string. So strings are like uh, text. So I'm going to show you what I mean in a second as I write this out. So if we want the mean, it pandas already knows sort of what the mean is. It, it will actually understand when you're writing um, in mean, median, and count. Count would be like count all the numbers of these. Um, so there's, uh, you can look up um, in the pandas documentation which ones it'll accept as uh, common, um, as these uh, convenient strings. But for now, we're going to do the mean, median, and count how many there are in this uh, group. So let's do that. We run that, and we're just going to reset the index. So every time I do this, it's basically uh, turning these into columns again, so that they're not like their own. In they're not actually the index of the data frame. So this, as you can see the difference from here to here, they are their own columns as opposed to part of the index. Um, it's just for visualization purposes. Um, so you can see that, it, again, you can list one, two, three, four, as many as you want functions, and it'll make a row for each of them for each group, and it'll give you the value. So you can see that not, no, uh, I don't know how to say this, Amos Remopolis were counted, and there are no meets, so they didn't actually count any of those as somehow in the data frame. Um, for at least not for these uh, variables that we're looking at for the weight. Um, but yeah, for the rest, you can see what the mean, median, and count are. Okay. So for now, let's do a quick challenge uh, just to see if, um, where we're at. So I'm going to put this right here. 
Use the group by and aggregate functions or methods of, pand of pandas data frames to find the mean, median, uh, mean, minimum, and max hind foot length for each species. So we're going to have to, so for each species means that you're going to be grouping by the species, right? Um, anyways, uh, and the second part of the question is what was the heaviest animal measured in each year? So that's using the weight and the return, the columns, year, genus, species, and weight. Um, here, we're, we're giving you a little hint that try to use, um, try looking up surveys.idx max. You can do that by either typing in this. So in Jupyter Notebooks, you can put the question mark in front of the thing that you're looking up. Um, you can do this and run that. And it, oh, sorry, surveys, sorry. And I'll give you some documentation here about how to use the function. Uh, what you can alternatively do is you can look it up using, um, just need to get this open using the pandas documentation uh, itself. So if you actually looked up pandas in Google, pandas uh, IDX max, it'll bring up that documentation. And this should be the same as what shows up in the Jupyter notebook, actually. Um, so it's a nice little fun feature that, or a useful feature that'll bring it up for you right in the data frame and also in the inspector, I guess, if you're looking through there. So I'll leave that to you for five, five to seven minutes. Um, but your sticky's up if you're having problems. Uh, or if you're if you're not sure what the, uh, about the question, I can uh, explain it again. Also, uh, the lesson material for today is you can find it either on the website under the schedule for today or under the syllabus, or on the Etherpad um, near the top, like around line forty. I posted the links for today, so to refer to them. Um, okay, hi everybody. Bring your focus back here. Um, so we saw a lot of different types of ways that you guys were trying to solve um, these two problems. Does someone want to oops, someone want to volunteer an answer for how you would uh, solve the first problem? You're gonna backseat code for me. You can just put your hand up. You can tell me what to type. I'll type whatever you want. Well, not everything you tell me to type, but um, what, how would you get the using group by and aggregate? Uh, how would you get the mean minimax of the hind foot length? So we've done, yeah. Yeah, uh, I went ahead with surveys dot group by. Okay. And group with species. Yep. That's dot right. What species dot aggregate? Yeah. Uh, in brackets, you have mean, min, and max. Yep. And see here, I don't have to um, yeah. type because these are one of the common. Uh, ones used for convenience and you and get that. Square brackets. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, right. Exactly. Okay, cool. It's great. Um, this is, so another way you could have done this if you did this in steps. So one thing that uh, we noticed is that um, if you do a group by, it doesn't uh, group by surveys automatically in like the surveys op, um, data frame stays the way it is. Yeah you need to set it to a variable, right? Um, so if we wanted to do this where this part is on a separate line, we would have to set this to a variable. So it's grouped, like before we did grouped surveys, group surveys equals this, right? And then we could do grouped surveys and then do that dot aggregate, um, sorry, I would have to do dot I, I guess either way it would. Actually, you would need. To, um, sorry. Actually, you would need to put the hind foot length first, so that it knows to aggregate on that. So if you're taking, if you're aggregating on all the other things, it'll actually, it will actually do it on all the variables. And really, all you want is one of them. So you're almost like, if it was a huge data set, it start, might start to um, take more time. So this would give you the result that you want. Um, so anyways, I think the next question is what, uh, does anyone have any, if you have a problem with that one, you can put up the pink sticky, someone will come help. Otherwise, we're gonna work on the second one, which I agree is probably, uh, is asking for a couple of different things, right? So first, we're asking for the heaviest animal per year, and then you need to return a second data frame uh, where uh, the heaviest animal is listed. So let's, I'm just gonna hide this. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do, sorry, using this IDX max, so surveys, um, I'm actually gonna use the group surveys that we already have. 
So group surveys, let's just do it again, just so you all have the code, is surveys.groupby. And we're looking at um, we're looking at the species, I believe. Yes. Oh, with well, the heaviest animal measured per year. So we're actually grouping by year, right? I'm going to save that group surveys. I'm going to name it year. I'm going to do group surveys underscore year dot um, of weight because I only want the weight dot IDX max. So this is where you would use the IDX max. Um, and what I'm actually going to do, sorry, IDX max. So what that does, um, I'm going to show you what it looks like first. I'm going to set it to a variable after gives me per year the line, the row number, in which the max weight occurs per the, for that year. So you can see for 1977, the row number that had the max weight for the, all the 1977s is 28,432. So I can actually save this. Um, so I'm going to save this to IDX um, or max indices. Right, so I'm going to save that just so I can use it later. You don't, um, you don't have to necessarily do it this way. Um, and so now that I have these max indices, from what I've shown here, what would I do with these max indices? Does anyone have a suggestion for what I would? Do? Yeah, exactly. But what was the last thing that it asked for? It also asked for return the columns year, genus, species, and weight. How do I get um, specific columns from a data frame? Exactly, so I use those square brackets with another set of square brackets because it's it's a list, right? So let's do that. Um, so I'm gonna do group surveys here, actually surveys of, so I can say of these columns, I think it was a genus, I actually can't remember all the ones that I asked yeah, for. Species. Your genus species, wait, thank you. Your genus species weight and I'm gonna so I'm gonna take those columns and then up and then I'll give me something and then from those columns I will do iloc of max indices right so from this will give me a data frame of so let me just show you that first I'm gonna take out this part just for now so this gives me just the year, unit, species, and weight, but it gives me every row. Do I want every row? No, I want the rows in which for that year, it was the max weight. And I have those max indices in the variable max indices. So I'll use iloc of max indices. And that will give me just the rows in which for that year, that was the, um, high, the heaviest animal um, for that weight, okay? Is this, um, so I can go over the, the steps again. The basic steps are first setting a group, a group by. You don't have to do this in necessarily in one step, but it does help um, just to get this step here. So I made a group, uh, a group by by the year because we're looking per year. Then I find the indices using IDX max where the weight is the greatest for that year. And then using those indices, I can subset surveys by those columns in which I'm asking for and then take those indices. So we can actually set this maybe into four steps. I could do this where I do um, year, genus, or YGS, wait, just to be short, survey equals this, and then do another one where I take iloc of those max indices. And notice that iloc is kind of special. It's not really, it's not quite a function. Um, it's not taking round, it's not uh, It's not taking um, something in parentheses, it's taking them in square brackets. Um, so that's just something to remember when you're doing iloc or loc, and it'll give me the same results. Okay. Um, does anyone have questions about any of that that we just did? Anyone have other suggestions of how I could solve this problem maybe that, I, that we haven't covered? Okay, so let's move on then. Um, so we've gone over how to group by um, and get some like aggregate data like mean, minimum, maximum. Um, but what it might be useful sometimes is to get the number of observations we have um, for uh, different variables, um, different groups. But how we can do that is by using a size function. 
So let's just show you what I mean. Surveys, you can just type along with me now. Uh, and put your yellow stickies up for now just so that we all can see um, how you're doing, um, if there's any trouble. And then don't forget to use your pink ones when you need it. So let's do surveys, dot group by. Um, and let's look at, per taxa, what the size is. Let's see what that looks like. You can run that. Um, and you can see that for the different taxes, which is bird, rabbit, reptile, rodent, you can definitely see there's a lot of rodents in the data set. Um, it just count, just gives you an idea of when you're when you have a brand new data set that you haven't even had a chance to look at, um, and it's hard to look at a huge data set um, just by looking at it. So this is a great way to just get a sense of what your data looks like. Maybe there's some variables that are in, that are in abundance, kind of like this rodents, um, and you can actually do this on a number of uh, just be, like before, um, group by can take more than one column, can group by more than one column, and size will actually work on that as well. So surveys dot group by. Let's do, again, we need the square brackets because it's a list of things that we want to take. Let's do taxa and sex. Um, and we'll do the size on this as well. And then, yeah. Oh, sorry, this way? Uh, yeah, okay. All right, so now for every rodent of sex, you actually see that there's only rodent here. And you only see that there's males and females. So um, it just means that all the other, uh, the bird, rabbits, and reptiles, they, no one measured whether or not they were male and female, so they're probably NAs in this case. So it's, again, a good idea when you're looking at your data and you have some missing data, it's a good idea to look through in these quick, quick ways just to see what your data looks like. Um, if there are many groups, however, it might not be exactly useful to look at it this way. So let's just like look an example of when it's not so useful. Group by, um, let's look at species, sorry, yeah. And someone asked a question earlier about um, why, sometimes I've been using single quotes, sometimes I've been using double quotes. Um, I think for the purposes of this lesson, it really doesn't matter as long as you're matching them up. So you can, if you're gonna use single quotes, use single quotes to close because it won't close if you use a double quote to close a single quote. Um, in some languages, they actually can be very specific about what they mean. In Python, it's a little bit more flexible. It can do the same thing in terms of setting strings. Um, but for our purposes, um, just for now, just if you're gonna use double quotes, just um, be consistent. If you're gonna use single quotes, be consistent. And then if you have some errors there, it'll just prevent some any errors that you might come up with when you're closing by different things. Okay, so let's run this one. I'm gonna move this up a bit. Okay. And what we see is that there's a lot of different species, right? And is it so useful to look at it this way? Probably not. Um, there's just so many, you wouldn't really get a good sense of what the data looks like. Um, so in this case, what we can do is actually maybe um, sort the values so that we can see which ones have the most um, data in them. So let me just push this lower. So I'm gonna do that again. Surveys dot group by species. What I'm gonna do is take the size again, but now we're gonna sort those values by using the sort values function. Let's see what it looks like here. It's gonna go from smallest to largest by default. Um, so you can see that the weirdest species um, has one, uh, one observation, whereas at the bottom, you can see that the Mariani, which is probably a rodent, <laughs> has uh, 10,000 um, observations. You can, yeah, yeah, exactly. Sorry, yeah, I'm covering up all the codes. Um, so I'm gonna actually just in place change some of this. If we don't want it to be going from smallest to largest, we can actually do largest to smallest. Um, so I'm gonna do that by setting ascending inside the um, sort value function to false. Okay. And just because I don't really wanna see every every single um, observation. I want only take the head of the top four, for example. Okay, so what I did is the same surveys group by species, take the size, uh, which is counting the number of observations, sort them, but not in descending order, just so it goes from smallest to largest, um, largest to smallest, and take the top four. And this is a nice way to just, in one line, I can see what the top four species observed are, right? That looks good. Um, but now it's like looking like we're getting a lot of code in one line and it looks a little bit chunky. Like you're doing a lot of things in one line. That's great, it's easy to do. 
Um, but what we might want to do is actually make the code a bit cleaner looking so that you can actually see what you're doing at first glance without having to scroll across. Like it, it's kind of chunky, right? So um, one way you can do this is by breaking it up into a couple of lines. Um, the same code, I'm going to do the exact same code in a, in a few lines by doing setting up some round brackets first. So just set those up. I'm going to enter so that I can write in them. And using the same, so that just kind of lets, uh, lets pandas know that we're about to set, thing up, set things up in a few lines instead of one line. So I'm going to do the exact same thing, surveys. But now I'm going to enter, and I'm going to uh, tab in just so it looks a little bit cleaner. Um, and I do group by species, species. And then, so that's the first thing we did, right? We did up here, we did surveys group by species. Then the next line, we're going to enter again, tab in, and then do the size. And then again, it's the same thing, except now every line is its own command, but it all belongs to one line. Does that make sense? Um, so again, we can do ascending equals false and head of the top four. So this looks much nicer, especially when you're starting to chain like five to five on, five and above. It really starts to help um, organize your thoughts. When you glance at this, you can see very easily in order what you did, how you did it, and it doesn't look as messy maybe necessarily as that first line. It's doing the same thing. It's doing the exact same thing. Um, nothing is different. So if I run that, it should give me the same result, and it does. Um, but now you just have an easier way to organize your change uh, fu uh, functional commands in pandas. So you don't necessarily need to uh, break the line at every point. I mean, if you feel like the size can go up there and it won't change how you're interpreting your code, I mean, it's really up to you. It's just now you know that you can do this. You can organize your thoughts a little bit more when you're coding. Um, yeah, so that was just a bit of an aside, but now we'll keep going. And I'm going to keep using this format just um, going forward just to keep our code looking nice and neat. So what it always, just don't forget the outside brackets just to let uh, pandas know that it should keep it all as one thing. OK, so before we did this head four and sort values in order, so sort the values from descending, like the largest at the top, and then take the top four. There's actually one convenient function in um, pandas that actually gives you the n largest, so n being any number you want. Um, so let's try that. I'm going to do surveys. I'm just going to enter twice, tab in. And I'm going to group by species again. Take the size. And then, and it could, and it doesn't need to be the size. It could be the weight. It could be whatever it is. And then take the n largest. The default is five. So I'm going to write that here. Let's see, that will give me the top five results. And I don't need to take the head of that. I don't need to um, sort. I will just automatically sort the values and take me the top five. So that's a nice convenient function. Um, and if you wanted to, again, we've always uh, shown that it, that group by is pretty good at taking in more than one column or sorting by one more than one thing. So let's just take an example of that. Again, surveys. Oh, question, yes. Um, so how come for the last one for species, you put like the double brackets? Oh, I, I guess you don't really need that. Um, you're right. Uh, I think I was just getting ready to do the next question. But yeah, you're right. Um, it, it will still understand that it's just one in a list. Okay. So it won't cause problems, but you don't need it. You're right. Um, so yeah. Uh, any other questions? Okay. okay, group by. And now if you wanted to do more than one, so I'm just going to keep consistent. Species, taxa and genus, and then I take the size of that, I don't know. I'm going to move up, and then again, the n largest, and let's say I don't want the top five, I want the top ten, um, that will give me the top ten right there. So again, they're all rodents, but they are different types of rodents, and the different uh, species, and the number that they have. So it'll actually list the different um, groupings for you, as we've seen before. 
So one interesting thing that we've noticed is like when I output this, it, this doesn't look like our data frame that we typically see, right? It looks a little kind of like less, um, less for, like formatted a little differently. This is basically a series. The series is kind of like, um, it has these, um, these indices that you can sort by for, or index by, but it's not formatted necessarily as um, a data frame. So what we can do to turn this into a data frame is just do the same thing. Sorry, I'm actually going to use the same code. Actually, I'll, yeah, just look there. And then I'll do, sorry, to frame, just this function that works on series to turn them into data frames. So it's very conveniently named. And look at, and there you go. It turns it into a data frame nicely like, like that for you. Um, Okay, so the reason that these are kind of like colored on the right is because these turn um, group by automatically turns the different things that you're grouping by into individual indices. So these is like this is like a multi-index. If you wanted to index by all the by the species, by the taxa, and then the genus, you would then get each row. You can get a combination of each row, pretty much. Um, but if we wanted to uh, reset the index so that these become columns as they were before. We know originally when we had them, they were columns, right? Not indices. So if we wanted to change those into columns, we could just then add another um, command just to reset index, which is, I've shown this before, but just kind of to go into it again. Um, we'll turn those into columns. And then you get the index reset again to be the number of uh, rows you have. So that's convenient too, if you just need to keep, if you would prefer to have that. Um, they have different uses, but uh, typically this is pretty useful as well. Um, so you might notice that the count, so the size, is actually over here, right? But the column name is zero, um, and that's the default um, for, um, it, if you had multiple, it would default, because it was a series and you turned it into a frame, um, it defaults into being these, uh, a zero, and then it would be like a one or two if you had other things that you're looking for. If you want to rename that, um, I'm just going to copy this and then do it down here. If you wanted to rename that, you can use the rename function. So now, so you can see here that it's really useful to have all these chaining um, in different lines because it doesn't make it so messy. So you're going to rename, and then the columns is going to take a dictionary. So a dictionary starts off with these square brackets, and it, you're saying that the item that is called zero, I want that to become size. Or you can do, yeah, they're all lowercase right now, so we'll do that. Um, if we had a column named one, then we could do, just for the sake of showing you, we could do a comma would be, we would call it um, weight or something. But we don't have that. That was just an example of how you might add more things to this column, um, to this dictionary. And then we do that. Now it's not a zero anymore, it's um, titled size, right? So it's just a good way, this is actually really useful often renaming your columns if, you know, when you get data from other people, they might rename their columns things that aren't intuitive to you. And for your purposes, you might wanna rename all your columns or do different things like that. So it's actually quite a useful tool to have. Um, and you can call, rename multiple, oh yeah. So let's just do, let's just change all the other titles to be different as well. So instead of, so we're gonna take the same one. Um, we're gonna just add to this. Let's just say I want this to be a capital S and then I want taxa to be a capital T. And I, right, exactly, curly braces, exactly. Um, genus. So what you see is that in a dictionary, you the thing, this is called the key, sorry. This part is called the key, and this part is called the value, and they're separated by a colon. So the key here is genus, so that means that is in the data frame right now, and you want it to turn into capital D genus. And again, finally, species is species. Let's do that. And now they're all renamed. So again, this is kind of a little useful tool just for, especially when you're dealing with other people's data or your data that, you know, when you're getting it from different machines that are reading in your data, they might not give you the, the correct columns that are readable to a human, I guess. Um, okay, so we're just gonna work on another challenge. Um, 
Oh, yes. Question. Is there an instance where you would want to remain your rural instead of your problem? Um, yeah, you can actually. So um, before, so right now they're like zero, one, two, three, right? But they could be like patient IDs or uh, sample IDs. You can definitely reset your index and actually provide um, the values in which every row should be. As long as the list of names you have matches the length of the array, then you could rename as however you like. Yep. Um, it's not rename because rename is for columns. I think for reset index, you would um, for that you would use the reset index. Um, so you can actually look at that right now. Um, question mark. Reset. Surveys are reset. So level drop in place column. So I don't think it's called the reset. It's not reset index. Um, I can look it up and I can get back to you if that's something you're interested in for or during the break. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, okay. So we're gonna do another challenge. Uh, so this one, using what we've learned, which was the size, um, how to rearrange our size, and how to re reset our index indices, and using the group by. Figure out um, how many individuals of each sex and genus were caught and surveyed, and then which top seven have the greatest mean weight. Okay, that should um, make use of what we've learned, and we'll give you some time to do that. Um, so take off your yellow stickies right now, and then put them back on once you solve those problems, or put the pink ones if you need some help. Oh yeah, and this yeah, we'll lead into the break now also. Um, so maybe we'll take. We'll, Sir? Sure. We'll do yeah. We'll do a twenty minute break and then we'll take up the challenge um, sometime after. Uh, yeah, after that. Okay. Great. Um, so we're gonna take up these questions now. So for the first one, so what we learned is how to use the size, um, the dot size method or function, sorry. And then we also learned how to sort things by the top or the top largest and then how to subset those. So the first question asks, how many individuals of each sex and genus were caught and surveyed? Um, so does someone want to walk me through this answer? It's got some yellow stickies up. Anyone want to just walk me through how you solved this problem? <laughs> Can't take down your yellow sticky now. OK, oh, I'll just go through with this. OK, so first what you can do is um, you're going to take a group by of sex and genus, sorry, dot group by sex, genus, then you can do size, right? So for every sex and every genus, you can get uh, the number of caught that were caught and uh, surveyed. So that's straightforward. Does anyone have any problems with that? Or if they did it a different way, maybe? This is probably the, sorry? Right, yes, yeah, so you can do count, um, which will, oh, sorry, which will count for, uh, sorry, we wanted, um, so count will actually give you for every uh, every column how many were not NAs, but in general, if you want to see all of all the columns, even if some of the columns are NAs, um, how many individual samples were there, and then size will give you a more, uh, will give you a bit more of a, um, shorter answer, sorry, what am I doing? There you go. But yeah, you could use count and then just take the, that value that's given it, the highest value in each one, and it should give you the same, but um, um, okay. The next question asks, which top seven species have the greatest mean weight? Um, so what you'd wanna do is group by again, take the weight, um, and we're looking at species, right? So surveys, dot group by parentheses and then species sorry species um, of weight dot max so instead of using the size we're using dot max and then you can do n largest as well um, and then we'll do top seven Oops, sorry There you go, you got the Aldegula, I'm not gonna list all these, but um, these are the top seven by weight, 
per species, um, to seven species that have the greatest weight. Okay. Um, all right. So, does anyone have problems with these challenges that we've, the challenge that we've done so far? Okay, then, so we've um, kind of covered a lot about um, the split, apply, combine. We haven't shown you every single possibility um, of apply that you can do. The aggregate function is basically what you would go to if you have any sort of function you want to apply over all your groups. You now know how to group by, depending on what column names you want to group by. You now know how to take um, subset this data, um, depending on what columns you want to see the results of. Um, so yeah, we've covered a lot on that, but now what we want to do is actually make use of this to do some plotting. Um, that's a really important part of data analysis, is being able to plot your data, visualize it, see what kind of trends are there just by looking at um, some of the relationships. And so um, let me just make sure, yeah. Okay, so Python has a lot of different uh, ways that you can plot your data. The basic package is matplotlib. We've, we looked a little bit in the, I think the very first lecture um, on how you can plot some things or even in the second. Um, what we're gonna be using is the Seaborn package and it makes, and it's really useful for um, pandas. Um, we're using it with pandas because it doesn't require you to change the data very much to go from one plot to another. Um, by using the same data frame, you can go from a histogram to a scatter plot to a whatever you can whatever you can think of depending on what your data looks like, and you don't really need to change the underlying data. Whereas maybe if you had an Excel, you need to like put all your variables in certain ways and then highlight that and then make your plot. And if you have to make another plot, you're gonna have to rechange how your how your axes look and then where the columns are. Um, so I mean, I'm not not here to dis Excel much, but. Uh, this will be very um, this will be useful for using the same set of data to apply different types of plotting. Um, so the first thing we want to do so uh, is actually the first time we plotted, we had to do this thing called with a this is a percent sign, and then mat, no space matplotlib in line. So because we're using a Jupyter notebook, um, this basically will allow us to visualize our plots inside the notebook instead of opening and trying to open up, open up a new uh, window or do anything like that, it'll actually show it in line. So that's just, you always, this kind of a, uh, this magic command for um, IPython notebooks. So I'm just gonna run that and I'm gonna import the package Seaborn as SNS. It's just the common short form for using it. And the very first thing we're gonna do with our surveys data is just plot kind of like um, a, a count plot, sort of like a histogram, of um, the different species, how many there are of each species. So I'm going to do SNS dot count plot. And what I do is I set the Y value. There's no X value. Um, it'll know that the X is going to be each species because I'm telling it, sorry, telling it to count it, and then data equals surveys. So this is kind of the framework of how Seaborn works. You tell it what kind of plot you want. You give it the X or Y, depending on the kind of plot you have. Um, in this case, you only need to give it the Y. And then the data is what data frame you're drawing this information from. So species is the name of the column that you're looking at, right? And then it will count for each species in surveys, uh, give you the plot, and this is what you get. You should get a, a plot like that. And so it's giving you all these different species and the numbers. So like obviously the one with the most is one of these uh, rodents, I'm sure, um, all the way at the end. And then you, some, a lot of these have no, or have very few or none. So, so if this isn't showing up in your notebook, you can put up a pink sticky. But otherwise, um, let me know if you need any. OK, you guys are good. Um, Okay, so that's a lot of species, and it kind of looks like a messy plot, right? This isn't the most beautiful plot yet. What we're going to do in the next use, in the in this next section is try to go through different types of plots, how you can change their aesthetics, how you can customize to what you want um, to see. So this is kind of like base out of the box um, seaborne packaging, uh, seaborne plotting. But we can do a lot more with this. Let's say we just want to look at the um, the most the top uh, four species. So let's actually subset that into a variable. Let's do that before we do any more plotting. We're gonna subset that, call it most common species. 
equals, and I'm going to use that um, that parentheses so that we can do this on number of lines. So you can do, set those to variables as well. Okay, this um, this kind of parentheses multi-line uh, chaining of commands. So I'm going to do surveys, only looking at species, and then I'm going to do dot value counts. So it'll count how many um, of each uh, of the species there are, and then take the largest four. And I only want the index. Um, I just, yeah, I can't. and then to index this, and then let's look at what it looks like at the end. Most common species. So it turns it into an index. So it, because in this case, it's a series, right? When we saw, I can take out this part and show you what it looks like for a second. So, so here it looks like this is a series. I only want the index, right? So that's why at that last step I'm doing dot index. Give me that. So now it gives me the top four species. Uh, they're most common, most common species. So now I have this list. And if I only want to plot that list, um, I can do something like this. So bear with me, just follow along with what I'm typing. You're gonna, um, and then I'll explain in a second what we're doing. Surveys dot loc. Um, so remember, dot loc is kind of like taking uh, the the named locations. So we'll do. Oh, sorry, shouldn't have messages. Um, uh, surveys where the species is equal to the most common. species of zero. So remember, this is a list, right? We saved it as um, an index, which is now a list. And if we take the zero width index of it, it'll take this first one. So anytime the survey species is of Mariani, um, take those values by us using that. And this is all in one parent round parentheses, OK? But we don't, want just want, we don't just want the top, uh, top one. We also want the and second most uh, abundant, right? Surveys. So we're going to do that again. Species, you can copy and paste if you need to. Uh, most common tab complete of this, the second one, right? Which is the penicillatus. And then again, so I'm just going to enter again and use this, um, this bar, which basically is like an or, OK? So it says, it's basically saying find if the species is of this one, or if it's of this one, and you can see where this is going, or if it's of this one or that one, and we're gonna write those out. Two, and then the other or, the final or, to get it all in line. Surveys of species, both most common species of three. And then all the other brackets should line up. I can move this onto that line. Um, so just to see what this looks like, I'm gonna show you the shape. So it, it, it subsetted it and found 19,000. It still has um, 13 of the rows. 13 of the columns. So we can just take a look at what that looks like, actually. So, so who here found that like a little tedious to do? <laughs> yeah, so good. Um, you're already like close to being full programmer who like hates typing as much as possible. Um, yeah, I'm gonna move up. Uh, yeah, okay. So there's actually um, a method in Pandas where you can use, um, where you can, if you have this list, um, you can actually check to see if the item is in that list. And surprisingly, that function is called is in. Um, so I'm going to wait a little second just so you guys can have all that. But um, OK. Oh, sorry. Um, put your yellow stickies up if you're ready to move on, and then I'll just.
So if you want, you can always just copy and paste each one and then change the number just to make it a little easier. But there is a way fast, there is, I'm gonna show you the way faster way to do this. Um, oh, even, even higher? Okay, like to this one? Okay. Yeah, no worries. Okay. Um, so does everyone at least have this part? Because we need this to move on to the next part. Whereas this one um, is just one way to do it. And it's more useful if you have very, like, you can use Boolean indexing. Um, so this is what it, what it's doing is checking to see if, you know, that true, false, true, false, true, false kind of list that I made that first uh, earlier on in the class, it's just doing a lot of those. Um, whereas checking if this is true or this or this or this is true, then set the whole line to true and include that line. Oh, there's a, okay. sorry. Um, okay. So I'm just going to show you how to use that list that we made, the most common species. And sorry, let's scroll all the way down. And let's do surveys dot loc of when surveys of species dot is in most common species. Oh, sorry, got to spell that properly. Most common species. Okay. Dot shape. I'm just going to show that it's the same result. It gives me the same size array, meaning basically showing that it's done the same thing without having to type it every single time. So that's pretty convenient. If you have this list of things that you're looking for um, and you want to look for only those items, you can use um, the is in to see whether or not um, the survey species column matches your the thing that you're looking for. And it doesn't have to match every single item. It needs to match just one, right? Um, so that's one way to do it. Um, so let's let's take a look. So our, I'm going to do two things. Um, let's print out most common species again. So these are our four most common species. We want to make sure that the species column matches one of these values. Because there's like 20 or so species, we don't want all of them. We just want the top four. So if one of the, if those species over in the corner matches one of these um, in the most common species, then take those rows. And that's a pretty quick way. Um, if you're subsetting your data and you know a priori which values you're looking for, this is one really easy way to do that. Um, so now let's make, so we have this now. Um, let's do something with it. We might want to drop any NAs again because a lot of them have, um, I'm going to set this to a variable, surveys common. If you do that, and I'm going to drop any. It's just called surveys common, and at the end, I have a drop NA. Okay, so let's look at what surveys common looks like again. It's basically our data, but it should only have uh, the rows in which the call of the species is belongs to one of our most common lists, right? Um, okay, now let's plot this. Um, this is what we we're doing. We're trying to subset a bit of our data so that we could only do um, plot what we're interested in. So we're okay with that. So what we've done is so we've subset our data using this local method, which will only look for the rows in which this is true. Okay, um, that's sort of how the how the loc works. You can you can either give it the columns itself, the column names itself, or some sort of Boolean true, false, true, false um, set of values to tell it which ones to give you. OK. All right. Um, so what we're going to do is plot that using the same count plot that we had before. 
So C Warren or SNS counts plus. Uh, and then again, the Y is going to be based on the species. I'm sorry, species could be in conclusions. And then the D from and where it should look for the species um, column name is in surveys common because we subsetted it just for this purpose, right? We're not going to use the other um, surveys data. And around that, you provide a nice plot. There's a lot of, uh, again, a lot of that of Mariami um, species there. And that looks a lot nicer. You can actually figure out that, um, see a lot more of the data clearly. Um, so the sizing and the, the, the default visualization or the kind of formatting that it takes is set um, is set to be, I can't remember what the default one is, but you can change the context in which uh, you will be saving this data and it will change how it automatically looks. So let's look, um, there's a few different contexts. Like the one is notebook, like your default is notebook. And then there's also talk for it. So it'll kind of change the, uh, of the font and stuff to uh, match for where you're giving it. Let's show you an example. First, and then we can adjust what's different. Um, you can also actually set some things like font scale because these are pretty small, right? Like they are the things you probably like if you're um, publishing the in a talk. And then we can do the same plot that we had before. Oops, sorry. Okay. That's uh has no sorry, set context. So that's an X there about that. Search work. So it looks about the same, but we can change that to, uh, actually the font should be slightly bigger now. Um, we could change, yeah, uh, sorry. So there's, I think, I'm gonna type a wrong thing. So don't type this. I'm gonna type a wrong thing just so it shows you which ones are optional. So I'm gonna do like random, stuff. I'm just gonna do some letters. It's probably not the best way you should do this. Um, you can check through the documentation, but it says context must be in paper. So if you're publishing a paper, you would uh, type paper for a notebook, if you're just viewing in your notebook, if you're giving a talk, or if you're gonna put this in a poster. So these are the four kind of contexts in which you set, like preset some variables. So I'm gonna do, um, let's look at what a poster looks like. Or let's do that. See how that's a little bit different maybe. So I'll get to talk about your boss pretty big. I think it was far away. Um, yeah, so I just gonna change some of the like default parameters. There's like a good feature to have if you're um, changing, if you want to change depending on what you're outputting your data visualization for. Okay. Um, but next, what we want to do is if uh, oftentimes you might want to do this in the reverse. Instead of horizontal bars, you might want to have vertical bars, right? So instead of doing, um, we're going to use the exact same function. So I'm actually going to copy and paste this. Or actually, I'll, I'll just type it with you. Um, so I'm going to move down. You guys all have that. Um, OK. So I'm going to do snscount. And I'm going to do x equals Old species. So, does anyone notice something I've already done differently? If you look back at your previous one, I set it to the x axis instead of to the y axis. Now that's going to make these um, bars vertical. Uh, surveys, for common. It's going to be the same plot, essentially, using uh, the bar. Uh, bar, bar, bar. Great. 
that could be, that's a useful way to get around that. Um, so because I'm setting it to the context this talk right now, the font size might be a little big. Um, so I can again set the context back to, uh, to notebook. All right, so that looks a bit more normal. Okay, so in this case, we've been only looking at one variable and just counting how many there are. Um, oftentimes what we wanna do is see relationships between variables, right? Like a category, we're, in this case, we're gonna do a categorical with a, a quantitative variable. So one of the ways that you can do this is by looking at summary statistics of some of the data using a box plot. Um, the finesse is actually just called SNS.boxplot. So SNS, as you born, has a lot of built-in types of plots. You can build up the types of plots um, uh, to each other using, putting them together. But for the most part, you're going to use the basic plots that are already um, built into it. So in this case, in the F axis, we're going to look at the weight of our species. Um, and see this, uh, the, the kind of descriptive statistics around that. So X is going to be weight. And y equals species. Let me put this in two locations. The data is again surveys, comments. They just want to get a sense of the top or not all of them for now. Run that. You should get a nice box plot. Um, so does anyone here want me to explain quickly what a box, like what the different aspects of a box plot is? Yeah, you've got some hands. Okay. Um, so basically you get the mean, uh, sorry, the median in this um, in this line, and then, oh, sorry, the three lines are basically for the 25th, 50th, and 75% course. Uh, course. You have these that align on the 75%. You have, um, I believe the middle line should be the mean or the median. Median, thank you. <laughs> and then um, basically, you're kind of you're going to be able to get a sense of like the skew of the data, like how how uh, how wide does it like skew, um, where the where the means and the average um, data is like um, centered around. Um, so it's a really useful plot to actually just get a quick sense of what your data looks like. Um, you can see that this one has a lot of outliers, um, but I mean, it's really useful if you have a lot of data. So gonna, you're going to realize that using a box plot for just a few, a few points isn't going to be very useful, um, and that's often the case with, uh, with some of these. Um, with some plotting, is that it, the more data you have, it's a lot more useful to use these summary statistic things. Okay. Um, Next, we can actually uh, use something called a violin plot to get um, smooth histograms of our data. So I'm gonna show you another um, way to visualize that, to visualize your data, violin plot. And we're looking at the weight of the So X, so the violin plot X equals uh, weight. Y equals and data equals surveys. I don't know why that keeps happening. Surveys common. So basically what this shows is the smoothened histo uh, sorry, let me go down. Smoothened histogram. And it's just mirrored above and below. Um, so you can actually number, like you can use these histograms to compare between different variables. We'll do that a little bit later in the lesson if we, um, hopefully we can get to that. Um, but it's good to keep in mind that if you're using smoothened data, it's really, uh, it can be, um, what's the word? It's, it's not necessarily representative of the data if you have little points, but if a few points, but if you have many points, you can get a really good sense of what the data looks like. So again, it's it's really good if you have a lot of data, but yeah. 
Sorry. Um, yes. Yeah, so exactly. So it means that this, those are the uh, start and end points of all the data. Um, so that means there are no fewer values than uh, than ten for the case, but there are here, and then these are the like, uh, you can kind of get a sense of where the middle is. Uh, it's a little. Yeah, and if there, it can be bimodal too, right? It's not always like gonna be look like that, depending on what your data looks like. Um, okay. So you can actually, I mean, these in this case, color isn't really giving us much information and we're not subsetting by color in this case. So we can actually remove this color. Um, keep your, you can just like a simple thing to keep your plots as simple as possible and only by information that is actually useful. You can actually put a new color by doing um, say n of the two raters y equals species data equals surveys common just like before. Then I'm also going to do the color and set it to color, and then it won't automatically. Um, set each uh, species to a different color. Okay. Now it's just removed the color and all you get is, um, you can set to whatever color you prefer, whatever um, theme that you have. Uh, some of the colors are, are um, obviously defaulted. Like you can just type them in like that. You can give hex codes. You can give RGB values, things like that, um, as well. Sorry, I just noticed you have to use American spelling, right? Yeah, it seems it seems to be in this case. Yeah, um, yeah. You don't? Oh, that's oh for the part of the video. Yeah, for the yeah, I guess. It's, it's, we should we should put in a request for them to Canadianize their code, um, or at least make it accessible to Canadians. Like, come on. Okay. Um, so, if we want to see um, to so let's look at um, plotting uh, the plot. Um, see when plotting the. The plot type and against their weight can and give us more information about the species um, distributions. So we can do that by looking at something else. We can use the plot, plot again. Box plot. Uh, sorry. X equals weight, Y equals plot type, beta equals surveys. So look at the box plot. Um, you can see that um, some of these needs to have like have like a lot of outliers away from the away from the, um, the mean or the median, right? Um, so we might be able to visualize that in the, using the violin plot. Um, so you, you know, you look at this and you might say maybe there's something going on there. Um, we can take a look again by doing the violin plot of this by looking at plot type violin plot. X equals weight, Y equals plot type, data equals surveys dot common. You can see that, so like unlike that first time when we had like these really nice um, sync, like unimodal like um, Curves, you can see that there's actually like a lot more information going on here, a lot more different things going on here, um, and you can then and in, in, like investigate that further um, by looking at like what might be contributing to these like different like groupings. Maybe there, if you sort of by sex, you can um, pull apart like these different um, distributions. The first thing we're gonna do is actually look at. Um, so what we're going to do is actually look at 
Um, how many, so this one has like two to three bumps in each one, maybe, yeah, two to three of them. So we're gonna actually look at, um, for each uh, category, how many types are there in each category? So that might give us an idea of which one's contributing to different groups. That's just like one way to think about it. So we're gonna do that by looking at surveys and comments, and we can use this assumption called N unique. So that's the number of unique, um, unique values in each, um, in each category. So it'll give us a little series. So within taxa, there's really only one taxa. Um, with sex, there's obviously two. Genus, there's two. Species ID, there's four. Well, different four different pair species. Five different plot types. Month, plot ID, year. Um, so we can then take a look at which ones might be contributing to um, to those different bumps. The first one we can look at is the variable sex. And what we can do is actually use a factor plot to plot across these different um, plot many of these for each item uh, that we're interested in, each variable we're interested in. So let's take a look at what that actually looks like. So we're going to use a factor plot for sex um, using plot weight and plot type. So we just did that function weight and plot type using a violin plot. Let's do a factor plot using that same information. So what we do is type in factor plot. It takes a factor and then plots it multiple times using the data that you're interested in. So we're still interested in the weight. I'm sorry, that should be in quotes. Still interested in the plot type, because we're trying to tease apart what is causing those um, different multimodal distributions. We're still interested in the weight. Surveys. Um, and now the important part is we're going to just make columns where every column is going to be a different sex or, um, is, or the black um, So in this case, I'm telling you to make one column for male, one column for sex. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, and I'm going to put one. And put us on the other line. Kind. We're still going to look at a violin. Plus. Okay. So it'll be clear what's going on as opposed to me explaining. So here, before we had just one of these, right? Uh, now we have all the different plot types across as the Y. And then for the column, you have a male column and a female column. And you see that it like pulls apart some of these, um, some of these bumps, but it doesn't explain all of the multimodal uh, contributions of the data. Right? So we can look at other things too. So, and also I'd like to point out how, how you probably made like 13 plots in the past like 20 minutes and how long that would take you next time. But I'll just, I'll stop there, I swear. Um, okay. All right, so, sort, um, so sorting by sex didn't give us all the information we're looking for, um, but let's try doing some, look at this, I try looking at the genus um, or adding the genus as well. So I'm going to take the same code. You can actually just copy and paste that. Put this here. Um, sorry. I'll go here. I'm going to add this uh, row. So instead of um, so for uh, across the columns, I am going to have male and female. Across the rows, I'm going to have um, the genus. Let's see what that looks like. All right, and I'm actually just gonna add um, another parameter, which gives titles um, to Cosmer and it'll be easier to read. Okay, so what do we see here? I'm trying to subset all that data, but um, okay. Now oh, it's probably a little bit more clear to see all in one view with you guys, but with your computers, but you can see that the different um, genus, uh, genus 
the genus, there's two here in the scape. Yeah, I'm not going to say the names again. Um, so it plots the different genuses on the side and the sex um, as columns. And you can see that now you can get, you, you can see that the males seem to have um, diff, um, different uh, bimodal distri or distributions in the different genuses. Whereas, um, and the same thing in the females as well, that they all seem to have the same kind of central tendency here, but that they're still kind of like split um, in this um, in this genus, at least in one of the genuses, it seems to be uh, well distributed. Okay, so there's definitely a difference between genus, but now um, let's see if that, um, there's still multiple species in each genus, right? So maybe it's pretty, you think that weight is contributed to the different type of species. Um, so we can actually look at that See what um, see what the size of um, see how many species are in each of the genuses and let's see if we can by that instead of by sex. Um, so surveys. We're just going to do some subsetting here just to get the size of things. We're going to group by genus and species. And take the size. All right. Um, so yeah, there's two species within each genus. So maybe that's contributing to the different um, the different points on the on the on the histograms. Um, so we can actually do um, we can actually just like take a look at the mean weight of each one. So we don't even need to plot. I mean, it's it's easy to plot and visualize, oh, but we can also just look at um, 30 seconds. Um, we can actually, hold oh, one second, I'm gonna put my I'm gonna, okay, let's get back into it. Um, so what we can do to get the average weight is what we've done many times before, go by genus, um, and then per species, Take the weight, um, sorry, take the weight and take the mean. Okay, um, sorry, I need to run. Um, did anyone, so we have a few yellow cities. Um, did others without the cities have trouble getting the plot or you want to update me? Perfect, thanks. Oh, yeah, sorry. You have a plot, but it maybe not necessarily the one. Okay. Um, well, yeah, maybe we'll ask you how to explain to me what you did and then we'll try to recreate that and then show what we can do differently to get the multiple plots. Um, okay, so I can start typing some of the code in, survey underscore common, um, actually I don't need that, stop factor plot. So we still want just the weight, right? Um, so we can do that as the X. Then Y is again the plot type. The data is going to be the same. So we're using kind of the same formula. Now, um, the two things we wanted to do was do columns as species. Uh, also, we could also split by genus. 
rho equals genus. Actually, let's just look at species first and see what we can get from there. And the kind of plot is equal to violin plot. There must be an error somewhere up there. Okay, I'm just gonna run all these. Okay. All right. So this is not what you got. <laughs> oh, it is you you got. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, perfect. Then that's fine. Oh, fair enough. Because there's probably some missing data. Yeah. Okay. Right. For some. Oh, makes sense. Okay. So yeah, maybe it's best then to just look at species because each species belongs only to one genus, right? So we, that makes sense. Um, okay, so you can do this, and you now you can see that everything's pretty much, basically weight is very reliant on species, but you still see some kind of like interesting things going on in um, the Ordii and the Baileyi. So maybe we can then go back to looking at, um, oh, an interesting thing is, sorry, I'm just gonna add one extra parameter that might be useful. Um, four is kind of like a good amount to have across going across, but imagine you had like seven um, species or seven species, you wouldn't want them going all the way to the end of your, um, like beyond the, your screen, right? So you can do something called call wrap, column wrap. So it'll wrap it down to the next line if you hit about, let's say, whatever value you set. So I'm going to say two. Now it brings it down to another line if it hits, once it hits the second uh, graph. So that's a really useful one, especially if you have a lot of categorical data, um, cate categories, sorry. Um, so now what we can do is try to explain, so there's really just two, two extra um, like bumps or like uh, large portions of the histogram that maybe we can be explained by sex. So we can go back to doing it um, by same as we have before, factor plot x equals weight, y equals plot type, and now we're going to do Q equals sex, data equals surveys. I'll explain what that means in a second, but let's just continue with this. Column equals species. Column wrap equals two. And the kind of plot is a violin plot. Um, I'm going to make this a little bigger just so that it's easier to see. Okay. Okay, so what we have here is I want I set the hue, which is kind of like a grouping, a way to group by color. So I set it to sex. So that each color, so um, it says on the side that males are blue, females are orange, and for each of the plot types and for each of the species, you can see that the different histograms for each um, sex and species, right? So you can see that there's Differences, especially in the already a bit, mostly in the Bailey eye, that they have these like longer distributions, as opposed to the females in the males, and the females have these kind of um, more tight distributions. Um, so that's a pretty useful one. But what you can do, oh yeah, sure, um, yeah. So the key thing here that we did differently is we added an extra grouping variable using the hue parameter um, to group by. It's almost like grouping by the sex and then coloring that a different color as opposed to making it another plot in and of itself, right? Because that's what we had done before is we set a row for sex and then call or columns for sex, rows for genus. Now we can actually just put it in the same plot with a different color. Um, but it's a lot of like redundant data. So we can actually make this look a little bit nicer by having them mirror, instead of mirroring themselves, the top can be one and the bottom can be another. So that's a cool, um, so cool, does anyone have this code? No. No, okay, sorry, yeah. Um, so we can wait here for a second. Um, but basically the hue can actually be, you can set it to any column that you would like to um, split your data by and it will, it would actually, if it had too many categories within one, it might start to get really messy, but something that has one or two might be really useful for this kind of plot. Okay. Um, uh, what kind of, okay. <laughs> Don't forget to use your stickies. Um, if you guys have any issues? Okay, 
So now we're gonna show, I'm gonna show you how to do, um, how to split the histograms or the violin plots so that they actually um, save some space and make the plot look a little bit nicer. So we're gonna use the same information. I'm gonna type it all out again with you just so you guys get used to this kind of syntax of seaborne plotting. So what we're gonna do is gonna, on the X, we're setting the weight, on the Y, we're setting the plot type. We're telling it that we want the different colors to be um, determined by the sex. The data we're importing, and the order in which I'm doing this doesn't really matter because um, it's, we're keeping it consistent, but because we're actually listing the parameters each time, you could you can mix up the Q and data, but try to stay consistent. Um, if you guys are curious about that. Um, the column will again be species. I'm gonna wrap them so that they don't just make an endless list of species. By two, I want a violin pot. And then I'm gonna do the, the new thing that I introduced is the split equals true. So it's a parameter within the violin plot function that will split the data so that it puts the histograms um, on top of each other. So you can so you can see, you can almost like compare a little bit better, right? You can see exactly where um, the males kind of lean towards and where the uh, females lean towards. And you can see that they're pretty similar in the penicillatus um, uh, species, but that they're very different in some of the other species. Okay, so sorry, I'll move back up so you guys can see. So I mean, this doesn't mean that you're gonna be using this plot all the time. This is kind of just an example of how if you just look through kind of the documentation for different um, plots, you can actually learn a lot of different ways to customize your plots depending on what you want to do with your data, uh, what you want to see from your data, um, how you want to visualize it, how you want to present it to others, how you, like if there are certain things that you're looking for, like in this case, you want to separate out um, or like really show and demonstrate that there's these differences either in sex or species in these histograms. So that was why we went down this path. For your own data, you're gonna have your, you know, your own kind of path you're gonna need to take to visualize the data to show the important points of the data, right? Um, and it's a lot of it is just looking through the documentation, looking up, you know, there's some blogs that explain different plots for different types of data. Um, there's a lot of things, um, resources out there for you to take a look at, but it's just one example of how you can customize. Okay. Um, next up, we're gonna take a look at something called the facet plot function, um, which basically can change the appearance of your plots very quickly without Actually, I mean, we've been using the factor plot, which is working on different factors, but what we can actually do is use a, actually, let's just do another example first and then I'll explain a bit more. Okay, so everyone have this code. You can put your pink stickies up if you need a bit of help. Okay. So um, let's, so now using the same factor plot function, we can actually do a lot um, without actually changing. So, just to show you how little we change, I'm gonna actually just copy and paste this code. You can do the same. And I'm gonna just gonna, so I'm gonna go through each one. Do we want, we wanna still look at the weight. We still wanna look at the plot type. Um, we still wanna separate the hues by sex. We still have the same data source that we're getting from. The columns will still be species. Uh, we'll still wrap by two. And all we're gonna change is the type of plot. So we're not gonna do a violin plot anymore. And of course we don't need the split because that's a violin plot specific parameter. And then just from that, we can get a very different plot. Shows a lot of, a lot of information as well um, without changing much. Okay, so that kind of gives you the, shows you the power of what you can do uh, with factor plot. Um, it'll, you're, you're subsetting the data in the same way, but maybe you wanna visualize in a different manner. And all you have to do is change what plot you're using um, or just indicate in the kind parameter. <laughs> so um, so the next thing we want to do is if we don't actually want to see, um, uh, if we just want to see the point, the, me the mean, uh, and see where the confidence intervals are, because um, typically that's more, I guess, a little bit more common, um, and depending on what kind of field you're in, we can do some, we can copy and paste the same data point again. And instead of using violin plot, we're gonna use a point plot. Um, mostly identical, I'm gonna add some things, I'll explain what they do in a second. Yeah. 
the join um, tells you whether or not the points will actually connect. So let's actually set that to true for a second, just to see what it looks like. What you get are these points, and join obviously has joined all the points uh, within one. But for this uh, for this purpose, the, the plots aren't actually um, related to each other, so we wouldn't want to join the points. It's not like a time series or anything like that. Um, so I'm going to set that to false. And the dodge basically um, gives them some space so that they're not lying right on top of each other, especially um, at least along the uh, the x this axis. So let's just um, to show you what that looks like. If we make that bigger, let's do that 2.25. Now they're a little bit further, they're actually further away from each other, maybe too much because yeah, I'm gonna change that back. Great. Um, so I think by default, it does the confidence intervals uh, that are 95, the 95% 95 confidence intervals, but you can change that um, depending on what you're trying to represent exactly, like this standard deviation or the standard error. Um, and you can set that number. But um, typically, that's, those are the kind of error bars that you're seeing. And there's a lot of data, so you, there's actually not much error here. OK. I mean, sorry, the confidence intervals are very small. OK. Um, so we've gone over quite a bit. Um, I think this is a good time to do a challenge. Um, so let's see if I have it here. Create a grid of count plots. So count plots, comparing the number of observations between sexes across months. So one of these is something you're grouping by. One is that um, another thing is going to, there's two things that you're going to be grouping by, and you want to factor plot of these things. Okay, so I'll give you maybe 10 to 15 minutes to work on this, maybe less, depending on how um, how quickly the yellow sickies come up. But yeah. So one thing I wanted to, or that we want to note is that um, it was really useful to do these factor plots um, given the number of variables that we're looking at in each category. Um, but you can imagine that it can get very messy as the more uh, items there are per category, right? And so we'll see what you think of that after we finish this count challenge. Um, okay, so just because we're maybe running a bit low on time and we just wanna make sure we get all the concepts at least that we wanted to cover, some of the concepts, main concepts. Um, we'll go over this. Um, it was basically just to demonstrate that sometimes faceting is like a powerful tool, but you don't always want to use it. Um, so in this case, we wanted to, so we're going to do factor plot. And that um, we can do on the X is month, right? Y, we're going to set um, to be the count. Actually, because it's going to be a count plot, we actually don't need to set that. Um, the hue will set by sex, and then the data is equal to common surveys. Sorry, survey is common, thanks. Um, column is going to be set to species. Actually, this is not the human sex is across months. We don't need that. Sorry, an important point about this would have been if I had told you to also do species, but in this case, I'll do it. Um, just to demonstrate. I didn't actually ask for that. Oh yeah, I did. Create facets for species. And, okay, and then row is equal to plot height. So when we say facets, we're actually talking about that column row grid um, formation, right? Okay. Um, and then just to demonstrate, and then the kind of plot we're doing is a count plot, margin titles. Okay, this might be, so yeah, this is a bit overwhelming and you're not actually really gonna get much information from looking at all this data, right? Um, if you needed to do like some sort of supplementary figure that does show all your data, maybe this would be useful. But in terms of actually like being that, like what that figure that shows, that gets to the main point, this is not it. Um, so just, uh, just keep in mind that like, you can do a lot with factor plot, but sometimes you have to think about what you're actually trying to show, as opposed to just showing as much data as you can, just as a general rule, I guess. Okay, so um, going back to the lesson, 
we're going to now look at um, visualizing the relationship between two um, instead of one categorical and one quantitative and the, or multiple quanti um, categorical uh, one quantitative and multiple categorical variables we're going to look at two uh, quantitative variables um, comparing them against each other oh yeah definitely compare them back to each other and then across multiple categories as well so seeing the relationship between two category um, quantitative variables uh, just wait a second so we can get all this. <laughs> Okay, are we good? All right. So when we're talking about quantitative variables, we basically mean um, things that are going to be discrete, or, like numerical in in sense, as opposed to item like types, um, like the type of plot that you're looking at, the type of sex, type of species, type of category. Those are the categories that we were looking at before. But if we actually take a look at um, our data, we can use the surveys. We're going to go back to surveys instead of the subset that we had set up. And you just use the info method or the function. We see that of all the um, columns we have, the only ones that are actually, uh, that if we actually look at what they are, the only quantitative ones that we look at is the hind foot length and weight, are the, uh, the two that we could compare against each other. I mean, um, these are numbers as well, so you can look at the type of number they are. Month, day, year, they're numbers, but not necessarily the kind of number that we're uh, talking about in this case, right? Um, so what we can do is actually um, do a scatter plot. Um, so because this is a lot of data, we're going to actually do a subset of the scatter of the data to get the scatter plots of all the um, of all these columns across against each other, uh, just to see what their relationships are like. So I'm going to show you quickly one very quick function that will do that for you. Sns.pairplot. And this will plot the relationships between all the columns against each other into a big matrix. Um, you'll see, oh, sorry, pair plot, sorry, you need all that data. Surveys. Um, so that will be a lot of data. So before we do that, I'm going to actually do surveys sample because it's a lot of data. I only want a sample of the data just for the purposes of this plot. Um, I'm going to drop any NA so that will kind of reduce the data set a bit. And then we're going to take a sample of only the top 1,000 or so values. Um, and I'm going to set the random state to 0. So what that basically does means it means that the next time I run this and I set the same random state, it should be random, but in a deterministic fashion. It will give the same random values again. And this might be good for reproducibility and things like that. Okay. Um, so we have that. And then I'm going to do, instead of surveys, I'm going to change that to surveys sample. Um, okay, so let's run this. Sorry, survey sample equals. Sorry. So that was, yeah, sorry. I mistakenly, um, you need to set this to a variable, and then this doesn't need to have brackets around it. Okay. This is going to make a pretty big plot because there are 13. I believe 13 different um, column IDs, column types. Yeah. So let's take a look at what this is making. It's probably a little smaller on yours. You can probably see it all in one view. Um, but here you can see that record ID, and then down here would also be record ID. Back to itself, when it's um, a along the diagonal will be a histogram of its value, because you can't really plot something against itself. That would obviously just be a straight line. Um, so it actually plots them like this. Uh, it doesn't make sense to really have a record ID plotted against anything, but it will. It's just for purpose for the purpose of this example. Uh, there's the record ID plotted against everything else. You can see if I just make this a little smaller, maybe just for this. Um, you can see that there are some relationships between um, some interesting relationships here with hind foot length and weight, which are which we already saw is like what we are interested in looking at anyways. But if you did have um, a data frame that had columns that were more of the quantitative uh, type, then you could quickly see any relationships between them. I mean, if you do any machine learning and you want to see sort of like feature correlations, it's a quick way to look at um, just plot, you know, um, if features are like really correlated to each other. And you, that's something that you wouldn't want typically. Um, but that, just as an example.
But in this case, we see that there's kind of like this interesting relationship between hind foot length and weight. So maybe it's something that we can actually, um, so that might be something that you would want to look at further um, later on. So um, it doesn't really make sense for the other kind of variables to be plotted this way, but just for the purpose, um, but for the ones that we do, we can, um, that are, are interesting, like hind foot length and weight, we can actually do a linear model plot um, using, um, we'll just do it uh, first and then I'll explain in a second. So you can do SNS dot LM plot or X, sorry, is the weight and Y equals the hind foot length. The data is surveys. And we don't need to take the run um, a sample anymore because we're using a subset of the data. We're not using all of it at once. So you can see that this, you can pretty much um, predict that this will plot a linear model to the data. And of course, this doesn't really look like a linear uh, relationship, um, but it's a good way to, if you if it did look like it, you can kind of, um, you can tell immediately pretty much from just qualitative observation of your plots. Um, but you can actually, if you, it also makes a nice scatter plot of your data. So you actually don't need to, um, sorry, yeah. Is this the data? Is it survey sample or survey? No, we're just using surveys now um, because the sample was just because we're doing all that data at once, uh, plotting it against each other. But now we can use all the data because it's only two of the variables. Okay. So what we can actually do to remove that line is do the fit reg equals false. We're using the same plot function, um, the same command that I've written before code. Uh, I can actually just change that to remove the line and you get a nice scatter plot regardless. Um, you can use, this is a good one to get your, uh, for scatter plots. Um, you don't really need the, um, the line if you, if you, do, if you do or not. Um, it's good, but it's actually very like saturated, right? You can't really see where the density is um, too much based on, you, it could be that uh, it seems like there's a lot of points like around here, but we can't really tell um, just based on how it is. So we can see that given that um, surveys, if we just take a look at how many items there are, it's like 34,000 points plotted on one graph. It's pretty hard to tell um, kind of the information, um, what's going on there. So we can do is actually um, subset it and set the alpha. So the alpha is the opacity of every point um, to so that you can see density in terms of how dark the region is and how light the region is, right? So let's do that, SNM, SNS dot LM plot x equals weight. Y equals hind foot length. Data equals surveys. Fit. We don't really want the fit reg again. It's false. And then what we can do is use this thing, um, is use a scatter keywords. Um, this, so this is kind of like a parameter that takes the keywords like alpha or size of the plot of the scatter point and actually takes it as a dictionary. So S can be set, S as in size. And these can all be found in the documentation, how you, um, the things in the keywords. Um, and the alpha is what we're mostly interested in. It's gonna be set to 0 0.4. So this takes a dictionary, which has those curly braces, right? And then you have the key. So it's gonna look for the size and it's gonna set it to 12. Look for the alpha and set it to 0 0.4 uh, for this plot. Let's see how that changes our plot. That makes a big difference, right? We can really see where the density is. I mean, we sort of had an intuition of what it was, but now we can really see that it's a lot like more dense here around the section, um, around there and around there, but it's like more sparse around the edges, okay? Um, so the next thing we wanna do is that um, in this case, um, we've set this, uh, we've set this to only, to plot all of it as one color. But what we can actually do is similarly to um, when we we're using the factor plot, we can use the hue a parameter to color the points based on a column. Uh, so in this case, we might want to look at plot type and see if there's any correlation between these these chunks, uh, these points where there's like a lot of density, and see if that correlates to um, the type of plot. So uh, we're yeah. The S, S was size. Oh, oh, so, uh, right here, right here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So in this case, the scatter. The size of the dots. Yeah, the size of the dots. Sorry. So these, um, so in this case, we're just kind of like demonstrating different ways you can change the the, the visual uh, the visuals of it. But uh, if you check out the documentation, it'll be a lot more like 
um, a lot more detailed and tell you what types of things you can change. Um, so I'm going to copy and paste that. So, you can, so we're not going to change much. Um, we're just going to add somewhere here, hue equals plot type. Okay, so that now it'll subset the color by plot type. And everything else pretty much stays the same. We're using the same code over and over. So we don't, so we see that there's like a lot of purple here. Um, and then like a lot, like lot of color variation everywhere. So it's not really explaining much by coloring it this way. Oh, there's a, a sticky over, the, a couple of stickies. Um, okay. So that's not explaining too much. But we see that like there's these maybe four or five clusters, and we're trying to get at like what these what might be explaining this. So doing the same thing that we did before, we can do the surveys and find the number of unique, um, right? And unique. We see that tax. It might be another one that could explain. Um, I mean, this is pretty like. It seems to work out this way, but uh, maybe we can look at taxa to see uh, whether that can explain these kind of blobs uh, where there's high density. So I'm gonna copy and paste the code again. So why I'm doing this is just kind of like to demonstrate that a lot of the time you're working with code you already have and you're just modifying it a little bit. You're not like rewriting your code every single time, right? Um, it's not, it doesn't take much to change, um, to change what you, your plot is. So instead I took out plot type. So this was plot type. And I'm going to change that here under hue to taxa. Right, taxa. And sorry, uh, I didn't put a comma. Or did I? So yeah, it's all blue. So does that mean? So what does that? What do you think that means? It's mostly rodents, and we've seen this a few times in our data, right? So you can see that when you're visualizing your data, you might have to con tr control for different things depending what your data looks like. Um, so, so that was a little un unexpected. If we actually check the size of each taxa, you'll see using just some of the common things that we've already done, group by taxa dot size, you'll see that there's far more rodents than there are um, of the others. So they just would be, uh, it will just bleed into the background, right? You wouldn't be able to tell at all. So if we actually, um, so it seems that actually if we look at um, whether or not they're high, whether or not these values are even measured. So I'm gonna do surveys. I'm gonna write some code and then I'll explain what it does in a second. Drop in a subset. So what I do is I drop an A looking only at NAs in the hind foot length. So that subset will look for NAs only in the subset that you're looking at. So in this case, the hind foot length. And then I'm grouping by taxa and counting how many there are. So it turns out that actually only rodents were the ones in which their hind foot and weights were measured. So actually there are no birds, rabbits, reptiles um, in, this, um, in that plot at all. So it's important to like do these types of, you know, you visualize quickly you see if there's any problems with their data, you, you do the checks that you need to do, and then you modify it accordingly. So what you can do here, um, let's just look at that same. So I'm gonna set this actually to a variable. I'm just gonna call it surveys measured, right? And I'm gonna check for each column Uh, the number of unique again. Sorry, surveys measured. Uh, sorry, yes, I should take out the size. Actually, I'll take out. Uh, sorry, I just need um, the drop in it. You see that when you drop it and uh, drop by hind foot length, the only taxa left is rodent. Uh, sorry, the only. There's 22 species still, one taxa, and different, um, all the rest. So then now you can actually look at different species then maybe, or different genus, genuses, which there are nine. So let's plot those and see if we can get some information from that plot. So if you want, you can go back. It's probably best. 
to copy and paste the LM plot code we have already. Go down, plot it there. Now, instead of looking at taxa, which we know um, is only going to be rodents, uh, we can look at genus. Yeah, that explains a lot more, right? This looks a little bit more informative to us. Uh, it's hard to see on this one, but maybe on your computers it's a little better. That said, like this plot, these two blobs here are kind of like the same, um, of the same species types. And these ones as well, these ones are of a different kind of cluster of species, uh, sorry, of genuses, sorry. Um, yeah. And we can actually um, change the view, change the appearance of the legend, um, just because like this seems not very, useful to have it that long and that large on the side. So just as another way to customize your plots, this is something that you can do. I'm gonna copy and paste this code again. Now all we're doing, I'm gonna, so one thing you can do is set your plot to a variable and then you can modify things within that plot. Um, so I'm gonna run that first, just so I can get that variable. And you can see that when you do G dot and if you tab, there's all these things that you can change. Um, like row names, add legend, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually the very first one, g dot add legend, legend. The number of columns I want is two because it's a little um, frustrating to see it all as one long line. Sorry, I'll move this up. Um, and then font size, let's make the font size um, 10. And then you should get a different, oh, sorry, plots two. Oh, sorry, legend, I need to set to false within the plot itself so that it um, you're adding a different legend, right? That's important. So now you have it nicely on the side. It's, it's how you want it to look. You can set the number of columns to three depending on the size of the plot you need, et cetera. Um, yeah. Oh, n column, n call tells you how many columns do you want the, the number of species to be formed into. So you can see that there's two columns here. Uh, so if, let's change that to three and see what the change is. Or not 23, but three. And you see that now it's split it across three columns, right? It's just for visualization purposes. Um, depending on what kind of data you're doing, this could be a useful tool for you. Um, so now we've looked at genus. So let's look at, there's also a lot of species, at least uh, if we look at here, there's 22 different species that we can look at. So we can use this plot again. And instead of genus, just change that to species. Again, we're just doing, making little changes, modifying our plots, depending on what uh, we're learning about our plots as we're going through it. You can see there's a lot, um, yeah, there's again, a lot of clustering based on species, which makes sense. You have this relationship between hind foot uh, length and, height and weight seems to be more um, about the species than about um, overall relationships between hind foot length and weight, but generally kind of going um, in a positive relation. All right. Um, so now let's include only, actually, I'm going to skip over this. So let's look at the, um, the number of species that there are again, and then only include the, top, the most abundant species. So we're just gonna take a quick look at count plot. Um, we only have, sorry, we're cutting a bit into the break, but maybe we'll do this last plot and then we'll head out into our lunch, right? Um, so count plot y equals species, data equals Surveys uh, measured. It right, does not need to be in quotes. So, of the measured species, um, a lot of um, there are a lot of them that aren't um, very abundant, right? Um, so, we we might actually want to take a subset of these, and a good point is maybe around one thousand. A lot of them have been accounted at um, a lot of them at least uh, reach about a thousand. So we can take a subset of that, explain why we're doing this in a second, measured dot group by species, take this size and sort the values. A lot of them, um, a lot of them 
like the, the most abundant has over about 10,000, but there's a big drop off at about 800 species, um, 800 of each of each of the counted species. So if we only want to take the most abundant, we can actually just subset for the top 800, uh, for the ones with at least 800 um, counted. Um, can you go to where you were originally like yeah. surveying measuring because I yeah. never got Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, maybe I think that's good to have that quickly right now. So surveys measured is actually when you just drop NA based on the height and foot length. So it'll be like this right here. Okay, so I'm gonna do a quick, um, so is that good? Yeah. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna do is just subset on the most abundant species and then plot that. So now what we've done is actually um, kind of combined all the things that we've done, which is split, apply, uh, combine, and then finally plot. And then you, there's a bit more, I think in the, in the lesson that we maybe will go, we may go over in the second half, but it's all online that you can look at after. Um, the last thing is to just split the data into the most abundant species, which drops off at about 800. So surveys, uh, abundant, sorry, abundant species equals species. Okay. Um, let's do another line, I, species, Count, where I count each of the species equals surveys measured dot group by species dot size. Okay, so that's going to give me the size of each species. And then I'm going to take that count and take the ones in which species count um, is actually greater than 100, only those, the most abundant take the index. It's sort of what we did for the most common species again, right? Um, and then I'm gonna print out abundant species just to see what that looks like. And that gives me a list of the most abundant species, the ones that have at least 800. Um, and now I'm gonna take um, that and turn it and subset surveys. Do you remember what that function was that I used to check if something belongs, is in one of these, uh, or it has one of these at least? Yes, exactly. So I'm going to use surveys. Uh, I'm going to set a new variable, abundant species. Equals, I'm going to use that uh, chaining uh, notation again, surveys measured dot loc of surveys measured of species in which, um, sorry, surveys loc dot is in. So I'm keeping this on one line just because it sort of belongs to each other, but we can also put it on two lines. Actually, let's just do that. Um, is in abundant species. Okay, sorry. I'm going to put this back here. And we can look at how many unique ones there are. Already here. You can see that now there's 12 different species amongst the top um, eight, the ones that have at least 800. There's one taxa, which is the rodent taxa, seven genus, seven different genuses. Um, okay, and now we can finally see how, and there's still at least 30,000 um, uh, records observed, right? So only about 4,000 was, was removed, but we can still now visualize the data that we subset. Um, so we can do g equals sns.lm plot x equals weight. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to hide this part so that you can actually see the code while I'm doing this. Weight y equals hind foot length. Q we're going to set by species, right? We wanted that the top. Um, the, the most abundant species, we're going to set the data to be the new one that we just made. 
surveys abundant species fit reg we don't really want to see the fit because we realize it's not quite a um a linear model a linear plot and then again this those keyword arguments which takes a dictionary where we're going to set the size to be about 12 that just makes it a little smaller so that the points don't um, take up so much space we're going to set the alpha to be about 0.4 so it has some okay like transparency we're going to take out the legend it's false and then we're going to add our own legend and, and call equals two font size equals 10. okay so legend equals all right i forgot to close this parentheses all right, so you should have this plot at the end. And now that we've removed kind of like those, the, the species that were in which there weren't really many counted, we can see that a lot of the groupings can be accounted for by looking at species, All right? So I think that's um, about it. If you, um, in the last minutes while you're looking at this, uh, at the code, you, if you could please write um, feedback on, so anything that you feel I could improve on, upon on the pink, um, anything that you feel maybe went well, on the yellow, that'd be really appreciated. Thanks, guys. Um, so we'll resume at 1 p.m.? Yeah, 1 p.m. Yeah, if, yeah, then we can, yeah. Okay, thanks, guys.